Hello everyone. This is uh, Dr. Madhusudan Rao and the program I teach medical students. The topic of today's lesson is few points related to the cerebrovascular accidents. There is a brief note on the basics of cerebrovascular accidents. The term cerebrovascular accidents does not indicate it is an event that is associated to the accident. It is not an accidental event. It is otherwise called stroke. Stroke is the term used nowadays for the cerebrovascular accidents. As such, the better term is the, what do you call the brain attack, as you call it as heart attack. Brain attack is the right term to describe describe cerebrovascular accidents. Let us grow, go briefly on this particular topic, that is cerebrovascular accidents. What are the types? What are the risk factors and the etiology and the clinical presentation? Okay, so I'm going to talk these points related to this particular topic. Coming to the definition, stroke is defined as an acute episode of neurological dysfunction that persists for more than 24 hours. Okay. Coming to the introduction, <clears throat> acute stroke is second common cause of death worldwide. It is the second common cause of death all over the world. And it could be ischemic or hemorrhagic, right? Ischemic stroke is caused by obstruction to blood flow, resulting in hypoxic injury to the brain tissue. There is a gradual death of the nerve cells when the oxygen is deprived of. Because nerve cells depend basically on the oxygen and glucose. When the cell is deprived of oxygen, there is gradual death of the cell because of the anaerobic glycolysis, which results in the local acidosis and release of the free radicals, thereby causing the injury to the nerve cell. And if the oxygen deprivation is continued for more than four minutes, there is a gradual nerve cell death and the permanent cellular death occurs in a period of 10 minutes. Hemorrhagic stroke is due to rupture of blood vessel resulting in leakage of blood into the cranium. Cranial space is restricted space. Okay, When there is increased blood flow, that is the leaking of the blood into the cranium, there is gradual rise in the intracranial pressure which in turn compromises the blood flow, thereby causing diffuse injury to the nerve cells. Well, cerebrovascular accident is basically not an accidental event. Brain attack has to be more appropriate term, similar to heart attack. It should be clearly understood by the students that potential for a complete recovery of the dimin diminishes every minute of an untreated stroke. The time is very precious. Okay. The potential for complete recovery of the patient from the stroke drastically diminishes every minute with untreated stroke. Okay. And our outcome will be devastating when the time is wasted before the start of the treatment. So early targeted treatment Rehabilitation, lifestyle management is as a multidisciplinary management would improve the outcome. Okay, so pre pre hospital critical care is crucial in most of the cases. Rehabilitation to improve the functional ability of following the discharge has to be provided effectively. Okay. Coming to the classification of stroke. Ischemic. 
basically broadly classified into ischemic and hemorrhagic. Coming to the ischemic, ischemic stroke is, is heterogenic in nature with more than 100 pathologies. Okay. The obstruction could be in large vessels or could be small vessels or cardiac embolisms. Large, large vessel obstruction could be due to atherosclerosis, okay, arterial dissection, artery to artery embolism. Again, the lesion could be intracranial, affecting the arteries of circular villus. Okay, or it could be extracranial involving the vertebral or carotid arteries. Circular villus is formed by the branches of the carotid system and vertebral basilar system. Vertebral basilar system forms the posteriorly as the branching of the basilar artery into posterior cerebral arteries. And posterior cerebral arteries laterally they are connected with the internal carotid artery with the posterior communicating, communicating arteries. And the anterior communicating arteries together joined by the anterior communicating arteries. So anterior circular villus is formed by the anterior communicating arteries. Laterally it is bounded by the posterior communicating arteries. And posteriorly it is formed with the branching of the basilar arteries. So, atherosclerosis can occur in these branches of the <coughs> circular villus, thereby causing obstruction resulting in ischemic stroke. It could be the blockade or the block in the small vessels that results in lacunar infarcts. It could be also due to cardiac embolisms. So emboli can originate in the cardiac chambers due to arrhythmias, due to valvular diseases. So dislodging of the thrombus from this cardiac chambers can result in the cerebral embolism that thereby resulting in ischemic stroke. Coming to hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke, as I told you, it is because of the leaking of the blood into the cranium. It could be spontaneous, or it could be aneurysmal, or it could be subarachnoid, it could be intracerebral, subdural, or epidural. We go in detail in the next class. Next slide. <clears throat> Ischemic stroke. Well, atherosclerosis may involve the large vessels or the circular villus or its branches like vertebral or carotid arteries in the extracranial course. And uh, small vessels can be affected by the lipohyalinosis with constant thickening of the small arteries. So this is one uh, it, Lipohyalinosis with constant thickening of the small vessels or small arteries can result in lacular infox. Cardiac embolisms can be due to erythemias, valvular lesions, prosthetics, or cardiomyopathies. In these conditions, there could be thrombi that are formed in the cardiac chambers. Dislodging, dislodging of this thrombus results in the embolization in the cerebral circulation. Hemorrhagic stroke, it could be non aneurysmal or aneurysmal. What are the risk factors? Risk factors for ischemic stroke are hypertension. So, hypertension, when it is untreated or poorly controlled for a long time, can result in the resulting in the main injury to the intima of the blood vessels that causes the weakening of the terminal vessels resulting in rupture. And abrupt, abrupt rise in hypertension, blood pressure can result in cerebral hemorrhage. 
diabetes again a risk factor for the vasculopathy thereby causing stroke and patients with diabetes are more liable for stroke smoking is another risk factor hyperlipidemia advanced age arrhythmias and heart diseases these are the some of the risk factors for ischemic stroke there could be some overlap between the risk factors between the uh, ischemic stroke as well as hemorrhagic stroke coming to the hemorrhagic strokes now one is the intracerebral hemorrhage ich well hypertensive vasculopathy can result in non lobar intracerebral hemorrhage hypertensive encephalo vasculopathy hypertensive vasculopathy is associated with non lobar intracerebral hemorrhage okay coagulopathy is one, one of the cause for the intracerebral hemorrhage again cerebral amyloid angiopathies caa this is a risk factor for low bar intracerebral hemorrhage so other risk factors be advancing age caa again chronic alcoholism drugs like sympathomimetic drugs the anticoagulants used is a risk factor and the anti antiplatelet therapy these are some of the drugs associated with intracerebral hemorrhage coming to subarachnoid hemorrhage it could be again spontaneous in 5% of the patients or aneurysmal rupture of aneurysms result in cause for 85% of the subarachnoid hemorrhages alcoholism smoking are again risk factors family stuff subarachnoid hemorrhages is again a risk factor for the in hemorrhagic stroke coming to epidemiology lifetime risk is about 25% from the age of 25 years it is same for men and women ischemic stroke accounts for 63% of the total strokes hemorrhagic stroke for 25% so if you look at that the incidence of hemorrhagic stroke is rather less common compared to the ischemic stroke but hemorrhagic stroke is associated with more fatalities okay there is rapid progression of the symptom toxicity leading to leading to high degree of mortality you can understand in the pathophysiology ischemic stroke it is because of the obstruction to blood flow and there is a gradual deprivation of the oxygen supply to the nerve cells as i told you nerve cells are very sensitive to hypoxia okay once there is hypoxia there is uh, no there is not adequate uh, aerobic glycolysis there is anaerobic glycolysis that results in the lactic acidosis a release of acid radical at the same time there is a reduced the production of atp and energy metabolism is imbalanced that results in the loss of integrity of the cell membrane once the cell membrane is uh, uh, functionally impaired there is uh, there is influx of potassium i mean influx of sodium and excess of potassium sodium potassium pump mechanism will be this term there will be increasing cellular edema thereby causing cell death besides hypoxemia results in the release of the free radicals thereby causing perpetuating the cellular damage that infarction that results in secondary to the ischemia triggers inflammatory response by release of cytokines which further perpetuates the cellular damage okay we saw the gradual death of the nerve cells takes place and manifests as the focal neurological deficit okay well 
coming to hemorrhage stroke it could be in hemorrhage stroke what are the type of hemorrhage stroke could be there is the leak of blood into the cranium say it is a could be intracerebral in intracerebral uh, due, to, due to the rupture of aneurysms or spontaneous bleed into the cerebrum spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage results in the formation of hematoma within the cerebrum which results in the results in the raise intracranial tension okay and perpetuate the ischemic injury to the surrounding tissues due to pressure over the blood vessels okay that will compromise the blood supply to the surrounding nerve cells thereby resulting in ischemic injury okay so that that results in the raised intracranial pressure which again co compromises the cerebral blood flow ultimately resulting in diffuse neuronal injury unless treated early so that's why hemorrhagic stroke is associated with high degree of fatalities when compared to ischemic stroke so raised intracranial pressure leading to sometimes herniation presenting with false localizing signs and brain stem compression and herniation results in cardiorespiratory arrest coming to the clinical presentation so when the patient comes with a problem a doubtful case of uh, cerebral vascular accident or stroke comes a focal neurological deficit say weakness of an arm or asymmetry of the face or involuntary movements or seizures so you should suspect stroke okay and proceed with the rapid and mystery evaluation and treatment so time is so precious because every minute counts for the faster recovery of the or the complete recovery of the patient from stroke so detailed history and the complete clinical examination is very important in order to arrive at the probable cause for stroke ischemic stroke ischemic stroke can occur irrespective of the individual's activity maybe in rest maybe during sleep or due to activity irrespective of the activity ischemic stroke can present patient will develop nausea headache and vomiting there is a progressive focal neurological deficit and seizures and the clinical spectrum of manifestation depends upon the area or the site of obstruction to the blood vessel that is the blood vessel that is affected that's why it is very important to understand the basic neuroanatomy of the cerebrum and its blood supply okay and the site of obstruction to the blood flow reflects the clinical manifestations which will guide you to the end time kill level of the diagnosis okay so intracerebral hemorrhage intracerebral hemorrhage can occur any time during routine physical activity or during intercourse it results in progressive neurological deficit in minutes and rapidly progresses to the nervous patient develops altered sensorium with a deepening coma there is false localizing signs and also focal neurological deficit and there is signs of raised intracranial pressure and seizures at the onset within 24 to 72 centimeter hours is the feature of intracerebral hemorrhage headache and vomiting headache is more intense in subarachnoid hemorrhage coming to subarachnoid hemorrhage can occur during rest during activity 
or during sleep. It could be again spontaneous or rupture of aneurysms. Patient develops intense headache, unbearable. Never in his in the history of his life he might have experienced such a severe of severe intense headache. That intense headache is followed by pain in the neck and focal neurological deficit rapidly develops. And there will be signs of raised ventricular pressure because of the obstruction to cerebrospinal fluid. And sometimes presence with the ocular manifestations. There could be unilateral vision loss, retinal hemorrhages, sixth nerve palsy, hemiparesis, aphasia, etc. Well, with the clinical history, you can definitely have the high index of suspicion of the cerebrovascular accident. Once you have suspected and uh, you do the complete clinical examination preceded by detailed history, history will tell you about uh, the nature of the pathology with which you, the patient is suffering from. Say, in uh, cerebral hemorrhage, it is sudden, sudden onset. You can say lightning onset. That is a suddenness when you see with the cerebral hemorrhage will present. Cerebral thrombosis of gradual onset. Cerebral embolism is again sudden onset. Okay. With the history, you can rather suspect the cause of the particular cerebral vascular accident. Say the patient had been suffering chronic heart disease with arrhythmias. Say the patient is history of taking a day antiplatelet therapy or the blood thinness. So the patient is likely to develop cerebral hemorrhage. Okay. So like that, history will tell you the type of pathology you are dealing with, and the detailed clinical examination will reflect the site of obstruction to the blood flow. Okay. Effect in the particular area of the brain. Each area of the brain have got distinct functions. Okay. If the blood supply to that particular area is deprived, there will be the clinical presentation of those um, um, disturbed functions can be clearly observed in the clinical examination. Say, for example, there is middle cerebral artery thrombosis. Okay. Middle cerebral artery is once the stem of the middle cerebral artery is thrombosed because of the atherosclerotic plague, there will be contralateral hemiplasia because the area that is supplied by the middle cerebral artery is the entire superior lateral surface except the superior marginal cerebral hemisphere. Okay. And a part of the Inferior part, inferior part below the um, below the inferior temporal sulcus. So this huge area is supplied by the taken from the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe and a part of the temporal lobe above the inferior temporal gyrus. So that's such a large area is supplied by the middle cerebral artery will clinically present as the motor as well as the sensory deficit in the contralateral half of the body. Okay. And then if the dominant hemisphere is affected, you will have the aphasia. Okay. Agraphia, aproxias, etc. And there is a contralateral sensory loss. You may place that with MA anesthesia. Based on this type of presentation, you can definitely suspect the territory that is blocked. That the, the blood vessel that is obstructed due to cerebral vascular accident. So the history and the clinical examination is very important in order to the, the cause of stroke and the, the blood vessel that is obstructed. <coughs> Sorry. So once you have taken the detailed history and the clinical examination, 
you have heard of the provisional diagnosis. Not to waste the time before the treatment, rapid evaluation, taking the imaging like MRI, and proceeding with the treatment is very important. There are different guidelines with regard to the management of CVAs in different centers. In the same way, there have been studies on the drug treatment associated complications also. And regarding the prognosis and outcome of the patient, the studies reflect different results. So we are not going to touch these aspects in detail in this particular lecture. And before I conclude, I'm going to show some of the pictures. So you see this picture showing, showing the stroke symptoms. Okay. Say, be fast to learn the warning signs. Be fast to understand the cerebral vascular accident before you start the treatment. So, okay. So, patient is losing balance. You have to suspect. Patient has got some ocular signs. Ocular signs mean there is blindness. One-sided blindness. Definitely. There is, uh, say there is a uh, Facial is asymmetry. Face is twisted and looking ugly. And the patient presents to you saying that, hey doctor, yesterday when I went to night to sleep, my face is good. Morning I got up with my twisted face. Wow, what happened to me? So you must have developed a stroke or well palsy. Yeah. So there is some neurological deficit. So well. Uh, A stands for a weakness of the arm. So, focal neurological deficit involving the weakness of one limb, again, should suspect stroke. Well, coming to the speech. Speech, again, uh, the dysfunction of the dominant hemisphere. Yeah, you can definitely suspect when the speech is affected, you can suspect the infarction in the middle cerebral artery territory, which supplies the Broca's area, which is located in the frontal lobe. That is the, I mean, inferior part of the precentral gyrus. Speech is affected. Then time. Time is so precious in order to initiate the treatment. Every minute counts for the for losing the potential for complete recovery. Okay, so this is what you have got to learn about uh, the stroke symptoms and the provisional diagnosis before you start the treatment. Well, this is uh, the MRI taken for the patient with stroke, showing the areas of infarct. Well, thank you, my dear students, for patient listening. Oh, this video will help you to suspect so and initiate early treatment to avoid morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much. Once again, we'll meet you again in the next class. Until that time, bye bye. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Madhusudan Rao and the program I teach medical students. The topic of today's lesson is few points related to the cerebrovascular accidents. That is a brief note on the basics of cerebrovascular accidents. The term cerebrovascular accidents does not indicate it is an event that is associated to the accident. It's not an accidental event. It is otherwise called stroke. Stroke is the term used nowadays for the cerebral vascular accidents. As such, the better term is the, what you call the brain attack, as you call it as heart attack. Brain attack is the right term to describe, describe cerebral vascular accidents. Let us grow, go briefly on this particular topic, that is cerebral vascular accident. What are the types? What are the risk factors? 
and uh, etiology and the clinical presentation. Okay, so I'm going to talk these points related to this particular topic. Coming to the definition. Stroke is defined as an acute episode of neurological dysfunction that persists for more than 24 hours. Okay. Coming to the introduction. <clears throat> acute stroke is second common cause of death worldwide. It is the second common cause of death all over the world. And it could be ischemic or hemorrhagic. Right? Ischemic stroke is caused by obstruction to blood flow, resulting in hypoxic injury to the brain tissue. There is a gradual death of the nerve cells when the oxygen is deprived of. Because nerve cells depend basically on the oxygen and glucose. When the cell is deprived of oxygen, there is gradual death of a cell because of the anaerobic glycolysis, which results in the local acidosis and release of the free radicals, thereby causing the injury to the nerve cell. And if the oxygen deprivation is continued for more than four minutes, there is a gradual nerve cell death and the permanent cellular death occurs in a period of 10 minutes. Hemorrhagic stroke is due to rupture of blood vessel resulting in leakage of blood into the cranium. Cranial space is restricted space. Okay? When there is increased blood flow, that is the leaking of the blood into the cranium, there is gradual rise in the intracranial pressure, which in turn compromises the blood flow, thereby causing diffuse injury to the now says, well, cerebral vascular accident is basically not an accidental event. Brain attack has to be more appropriate term, similar to heart attack. It should be clearly understood by the students that potential for complete recovery of the dimin diminishes every minute of an untreated stroke. The time is very precious. Okay. The potential for complete recovery of the patient from uh, the stroke drastically diminishes every minute with untreated stroke. Okay. And our outcome will be devastating when the time is wasted before the start of the treatment. So early targeted treatment, rehabilitation, lifestyle management is as a multidisciplinary management would improve the outcome. Okay. So pre-hospital pre critical care is crucial in most of the cases. Rehabilitation to improve the functional ability of following the discharge has to be provided effectively. Okay. Coming to the classification of stroke. Ischemic, basically broadly classified into ischemic and hemorrhagic. Coming to the ischemic, ischemic stroke is, is heterogenic in nature with more than 100 pathologies. Okay. The obstruction could be in large vessels or could be small vessels or cardiac embolisms. Large, large vessel obstruction could be due to atherosclerosis. Okay, arterial dissection, artery to artery embolism. Again, the lesion could be intracranial, affecting the arteries of circular villus. Okay, or it could be extracranial, involving the vertebral or carotid arteries. Circular villus is formed by the branches of the carotid system and vertebral basilar system. Vertebral basilar system forms the 
posteriorly as the branching of the basilar artery into posterior cerebral arteries. And posterior cerebral arteries laterally they are connected to the internal carotid artery with the posterior communicating, communicating arteries. And the anterior communicating arteries together joined by the anterior communicating arteries. So anteriorly circular villus is formed by the anterior communicating arteries. Laterally, it is bounded by the posterior communicating arteries. And posteriorly, it is formed by the branching of the basilar arteries. So atherosclerosis can occur in these branches of the <coughs> circular villus. Thereby can also causing obstruction resulting in ischemic stroke. It could be the blockade or the block in the small vessels that results in lacunar infox. It could be also due to cardiac embolisms. So emboli can originate in the cardiac chambers due to arrhythmias, due to valvular diseases. So dislodging of the thrombus from this cardiac chambers can result in the cerebral embolism that by, thereby resulting in ischemic stroke. Coming to hemorrhagic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, as I told you, it is because of the leaking of the blood into the cranium. It could be spontaneous or it could be aneurysmal or it could be subarachnoid. It could be intracerebral, subdural, or epidural. We go in detail in the next class. Next slide. <clears throat> Ischemic stroke. Well, atherosclerosis may involve the large vessels or the circular villages or its branches like vertebral or carotid arteries in the extracranial course. And uh, small vessels can be affected by the lipohyalinosis with constant thickening of the small arteries. So this is one uh, lipohyalinosis with constant thickening of the small vessels or small arteries can result in lacular infox. Cardiac embolisms can be due to erythemias, valvular lesions, prosthetics, or cardiomyopathies. In these conditions, there could be thrombi that are formed in the cardiac chambers. Dislodging, dislodging of these thrombus results in the embolization in the cerebral circulation. Hemorrhagic stroke, it could be non aneurysmal or aneurysm. What are the risk factors? Risk factors for ischemic stroke are hypertension, so hypertension, when it is untreated or poorly controlled for a long time, can result in the resulting in the mean, uh, injury to the intima of the blood vessels that causes the weakening of the terminal vessels, resulting in rupture. And abrupt, abrupt rise in hypertension, blood pressure can result in cerebral hemorrhage. Diabetes is again a risk factor for the vasculopathy, thereby causing stroke. And patients with diabetes are more liable for stroke. Smoking is another risk factor. Hyperlipidemias, advanced disease, arrhythmias, and heart diseases. These are the, some of the risk factors for ischemic stroke. There could be some overlap between the risk factors between the uh, ischemic stroke as well as hemorrhagic stroke. Coming to the hemorrhagic strokes, now one is the intracerebral hemorrhage, ICH. Well, hypertensive vasculopathy can result in non lobal intracerebral hemorrhage. Hypertensive encephalo vasculopathy, hypertensive vasculopathy is associated with non-lobal intracerebral hemorrhage, okay? 
Coagulopathy is one of the cause for the intracerebral amyloid ischemia. Cerebral amyloid angiopathies, CAA, this is a risk factor for low bar intracerebral hemorrhage. So other risk factors being advancing age, CAA again, chronic alcoholism, drugs like symptomatic drugs, the anticoagulants use is a risk factor and the antiplatelet therapy. These are some of the drugs associated with intracerebral hemorrhage. Coming to subacronal hemorrhage, it could be again spontaneous in 5% of the patients or aneurysmal rupture of aneurysms resulting cause for 85% of the subacronal hemorrhages. Alcoholism, smoking, or again, risk factors. Family stuff, subarachnoid hemorrhage is again a risk factor for the hemorrhagic stroke. Coming to epidemiology, lifetime risk is about 25% from the age of 25 years. It is the same for men and women. Ischemic stroke accounts for 63% of the total strokes. Hemorrhagic stroke for 25%. So if you look at that, incidence of hemorrhagic stroke is rather less common compared to the ischemic stroke. But hemorrhagic stroke is associated with more fatalities. Okay, There is rapid progression of the symptom tolerance leading to, leading to high degree of mortality. You can understand in the pathophysiology. Ischemic stroke, it is because of the obstruction to blood flow. And there is a gradual deprivation of the oxygen supply to the nerve cells. As I told you, nerve cells are very sensitive to hypoxia. Okay. Once there is hypoxia, there is a, no, there is a not adequate uh, aerobic glycolysis. There is anaerobic glycolysis that results in the lactic acidosis. A release of acid radicals. At the same time, there is a reduced production of ATP and en en energy metabolism is imbalanced. That results in the loss of integrity of the cell membrane. Once the cell membrane is uh, uh, functionally impaired, there is, uh, there is influx of potassium, I mean, influx of sodium and Express of potassium. Sodium potassium pump mechanism will be disturbed. There will be increasing cellular edema, thereby causing cell death. Besides, hypoxemia results in the release of the free radicals, thereby causing perpetuating the cellular damage. That infarction that results in secondary to the ischemia triggers inflammatory response by release of cytokines, which further perpetuates the cellular damage. Okay, we saw the gradual death of the nerve cells takes place and manifests as the focal neurological deficit. Okay. Well, coming to hemorrhagic stroke, it could be in hemorrhagic stroke, whatever the type of hemorrhagic stroke could be, there is the leak of blood into the cranium. So it is the, could be intracerebral, in intracerebral uh, due, to, due to the rupture of aneurysms or spontaneous bleed into the cerebrum. Spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage results in the formation of hematoma within the cerebrum which results in the results in the raised intracranial tension, okay? And perpetuate the ischemic injury to the surrounding tissues due to pressure over the blood vessels, okay? That will compromise the blood supply to the surrounding nerve cells, thereby resulting in ischemic injury, okay? So, that, that results in the raised intracranial pressure 
which again co compromises the cerebral blood flow, ultimately resulting in diffuse neuronal injury, unless treated early. So that's why hemorrhagic stroke is associated with high degree of fatalities when compared to ischemic stroke. So raised intercranial pressure leading to sometimes herniation, presenting with the fossil localizing signs, and brainstem combustion and herniation results in cardiorespiratory arrest. Coming to the clinical presentation. So when the patient comes with the problem, a doubtful case of a cerebral vascular accident or stroke, comes a focal neurological deficit, say weakness of the norm, or asymmetry of the face, or involuntary movements, or seizures. So you should suspect stroke, okay? and proceed with the rapid evaluation and treatment. So time is so precious because every minute counts for the faster recovery of the, or the complete recovery of the patient from stroke. So detailed history and a complete clinical examination is very important in order to elaborate the problem cause for stroke, ischemic stroke. Ischemic stroke can occur irrespective of the individual's activity. Maybe in rest, maybe due to sleep, or due to activity, irrespective of the activity, ischemic stroke can present. Patient will develop nausea, headache, and vomiting. There is a progressive focal neurological deficit and seizures. And uh, clinical spectrum of manifestation depends upon the area or the site of obstruction to the blood vessel. That is the blood vessel that is affected. That's why it is very important to understand the basic neuroanatomy of the cerebrum and its blood supply. Okay. And the site of obstruction to the blood flow reflects the clinical manifestations, which will guide you to the end time level of the diagnosis. Okay. So intracerebral hemorrhage. Intracerebral hemorrhage can occur anytime during routine physical activity or during intercourse. It results in progressive neurological deficit in minutes and rapidly progresses to the nervous. Patient develops altered sensorium with a deepening coma. There are false localizing signs and also focal neurological deficit. And there is signs of raised intracranial pressure and seizures at the onset within 24 to 72, 72 hours is the feature of intracerebral hemorrhage. Headache and vomiting. Headache is more intense in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Coming to subarachnoid hemorrhage. Can occur during this, during activity or during sleep. It could be, again, spontaneous or rupture of aneurysms. Patient develops intense headache, unbearable, Never in his in the history of his life he might have experienced such a severe of severe intense headache. That intense headache is followed by pain in the neck and focal neurological deficit rapidly develops. And there will be signs of raised intracranial pressure because of the obstruction to cerebrospinal fluid. And sometimes presents with the ocular manifestations. There could be unilateral visual loss, retinal hemorrhages, sixth nerve palsy, hemiparesis, aphasia, etc. Well, with the clinical history, you can definitely have the high index of suspicion of the cerebral vascular accident. Once you have suspected, and you do the complete 
clinical examination preceded by detailed history. History will tell you about uh, the nature of the pathology with which you, the patient is suffering from. Say in uh, cerebral hemorrhage, it is sudden, sudden onset. You can say lightning onset. That is a suddenness when you see with the cerebral hemorrhage will present. Cerebral thrombosis of gradual onset. Cerebral embolism is again sudden onset. Okay. With the history, you can rather suspect the cause of the particular cerebral vascular accident. Say the patient had been suffering chronic heart disease with arrhythmia. Say the patient is history of taking a day antiplatelet therapy or the blood thinness. So the patient is likely to develop cerebral hemorrhage. Okay. So like that. History will tell you the type of pathology you are dealing with and the detailed clinical examination will reflect the site of obstruction to the blood flow, okay? Affect in this particular area of the brain. Each area of the brain have got distinct functions, okay? If the blood supply to that particular area is deprived, there will be the clinical presentation of those same, um, disturbed functions can be clearly observed in the clinical examination. Say, for example, there is middle cerebral artery thrombosis. Okay. Middle cerebral artery, once the stem of the middle cerebral artery is thrombosed because of the atherosclerotic plague, there will be contralateral hemiplasia because the area that is supplied by the middle cerebral blood artery is the entire superior lateral surface except the superior marginal cerebral hemisphere. Okay. And a part of the inferior part, inferior part below the um, below the inferior temporal sulcus. So this huge area is supplied by the taken from the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe and a part of the temporal lobe above the inferior temporal gyrus. So that's such a large area supplied by the middle cerebral artery will clinically present as the motor as well as the sensory deficit in the contralateral lobe of the body. Okay. And there, if the dominant hemisphere is affected, you will have the aphasia. Okay agraphia, aproxias, etc. And there is a contralateral sensory loss. You may place that with MA anesthesia. Based on this type of presentation, you can definitely suspect the territory that is blocked. That the, the blood vessel that is obstructed due to cerebral vascular accident. So the history and the clinical examination is very important in order to tell the, at the cause of stroke and the, <laughs> the blood vessel that is <laughs> obstructed. <laughs> Sorry. So once you have taken the detailed history and the clinical examination, you have arrived at the provisional diagnosis. Not to waste the time before the treatment, rapid evaluation, taking the imaging like MRI and proceeding with the treatment is very important. There are different guidelines with regard to the management of CVS in different centers. In the same way, there have been studies on the drug treatment associated complications also. And regarding the prognosis, prognosis and outcome of the patient, the studies reflect different results. So we are not going to touch these aspects in detail in this particular lecture. And before I conclude, I'm going to show some of the pictures. So you see this picture showing, showing the stroke symptoms. Okay. Say, be fast to learn the warning signs. Be fast to understand the cerebral vascular accident before you start the treatment. So, okay. So patient is losing balance. You have to suspect. Patient has got some ocular signs. 
ocular science means there is blindness, one sided blindness, definitely. There is, a, say, there is a facial dis the asymmetry. Face is twisted and looking ugly. And the patient presents to you saying that, hey, doctor, yesterday when I went to night to sleep, my face is good. Morning, I got up with my twisted face. Wow, what happened to me? So you must have developed a stroke or well palsy. Yeah. So there is some neurological deficit. So well, uh, A stands for a weakness of the arm. So focal neurological deficit involving the weakness of one limb, again, should suspect stroke. Well, coming to the speech. Speech again, uh, the dysfunction of the dominant hemisphere. And you can definitely suspect when the speech is affected, you can suspect and the infarction in the middle cerebral artery territory, which supplies the broadcast area, which is located in the frontal lobe. That is the, I mean, inferior part of the precentral gyrus. Speech is affected. Then time. Time is so precious in order to initiate the treatment. Every minute counts for the for losing the potential for complete recovery. Okay. So this is what you have got to learn about uh, the stroke symptoms and the provisional diagnosis before you start the treatment. Well, this is uh, the MRI taken by the patient with stroke, showing the areas of infarct. Well, thank you, my dear students, for patient listening. Hope oh, this video will help you to suspect so and initiate early treatment to avoid morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much. Once again, we'll meet again in the next class. Until that time, bye bye.